Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. So excited that you're all here worshiping with us today. Our main text for today is going to be in Philippians 3. And so if you want to go ahead and turn there now, you can. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. Ushers are coming down the aisles now and they can get you a Bible. The verses will also be up on the screen here a bit as well. So today, this morning, we're going to be looking at our final deadly sin, which is gluttony, the sin of overindulgence, the sin of uncontrollable appetites, the sin that of all the deadly sins, this is the one that I probably struggle with the most because I am helpless against the siren song of Bluebell and Shipley's, right? Like, (laughs) as I was working on this sermon, it was early in the morning and my daughter, she came up to me and she goes, dad, dad, can I please have some cookies? I said, no, sweetheart, it's morning time. You need to eat breakfast, something healthy. And then I sat down to write this sermon, and a memory flashed in my mind, a memory from the night before, when I had polished off an entire plate of brownies at 10 o'clock at night while watching Lego Masters. <laughs> and I just thought, ugh, I, I'm a hypocrite, right? Like, I am trying to teach my daughter self-control and healthy eating, while at the same time, I will eat myself out of breath, right? And I will eat until I break a sweat. I don't think that's supposed to happen but I do that regularly. All that to say is we're all in this together, right? Uh, Writing this sermon has been super convicting for me, just like a lot of the sermons from this series. And I think that that's a good thing. We need that conviction if we're going to humble ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to do a transformational work in our lives. And so that's my prayer for all of us, is that throughout this entire series, that it's been a, a hurt so good kind of series where uh, it leads to actual life change and it leads us to grow grow closer uh, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So quick show of hands, how many people here have ever heard an entire sermon on gluttony before? Three, great. Three people out of what, a thousand? Three people out of a thousand have heard an entire sermon on gluttony. I've been going to church pretty much all my life, I've never once heard an entire sermon dedicated to gluttony. And I wonder why that is. Like, I wonder why we never, ever talk about gluttony. Maybe it's because gluttony doesn't seem like that big a deal, especially compared to the other deadly sins, right? Like, are you trying to compare something like lust with ordering the Blooming Onion at Outback Steakhouse? Like, are those really the same thing? Like, are you trying to tell me that rage is on the same level as like eating an entire sleeve of Thin Mints, right? It's just that they don't seem comparable at all. And so what I want us to do is I want to look at some numbers together, some cold hard facts, some statistics. And let's see uh, about the state of our culture right now, where we're at when it comes to gluttony. So the CDC reports that around 67% of U.S. adults are either overweight or obese, 67%. That's, that's, a, that's a high number. And this is what I found particularly alarming. In 1960, according to the CDC, the average American male weighed somewhere around 166 pounds. By 2002, it had increased to 190 pounds. From 2002 to, to 2016, the average weight jumped another 8.5 pounds on average for men. So that in 2019, the average American man weighs close to 200 pounds. Now, I'm not going to talk about the statistics of women's weight because my grandmother taught me, drilled into my mind from a very early age, that that is incredibly rude to do. (laughs) So, all I'll say is that the numbers are not much better, that this is clearly a problem for both genders. Uh, Also, uh, I want to make one important note that uh, your body type does not necessarily indicate gluttony. There are plenty of people who might be considered overweight, but that's because of genetics or because of a medical condition or because they're taking a certain type of medicine, and really, it's out of their hands. And on the flip side of that, there are plenty of people who might look like they're really healthy, but their eating habits are definitely gluttonous. I had a friend in high school who just hit the genetic lottery, I guess, like he was shredded and he had a six pack. And then at the age of 17, he went to the doctor and he found out that his cholesterol was off the charts, like way too high, especially for a teenager. And it turns out 
that eating donuts every single day before school and then, and then having a Big Mac every single day after football practice is not healthy for you. Who knew, right? Um, so I just want to make that note. But it's obvious that we have a problem with gluttony in America. And I think, think the fact that uh, the American culture glorifies gluttony is not helping at all. Like, have you ever seen a Carl's Jr. commercial? Those commercials are insane. Like, what message are you trying to send by having a girl in a bikini eat a 3,000-calorie bacon cheeseburger on top of a Camaro? Like, what, what are you trying to sell here, right? Uh, and it's not just Americans in general, but specifically, this is a, an American Christian problem. The late, great Billy Graham once said, gluttony is a sin that most of us commit, but that few of us mention. It is one of the most prevalent sins among Christians. So, it's one of the most prevalent sins amongst Christians, yet we never ever talk about it. Why? Well, I think that there are probably dozens and dozens of reasons, but I am going to throw out three guesses. These are three of my guesses. Uh, one is that it's really easy to talk about sins that you don't personally struggle with or that you can hide easily. Like, I guarantee you that there are plenty of people around the world who would publicly condemn someone for committing adultery, while at the same time, they would empty their life savings to prevent their pastor from seeing their internet search history, right? Because they know that they struggle with lust too, they can just hide it better, right? But with gluttony, it's not as easy to hide. There are often physical signs from overindulging, whether it's gaining weight or developing medical conditions, you can't hide it as easily, which leads to my next reason that we don't talk about it, because when we talk about gluttony, there is often a fair amount of shame involved, right? And as Christians, we don't want people to feel self-conscious. We don't want people to feel embarrassed or ashamed. We want the opposite. We want people to feel loved and, and wanted and accepted, right? And frankly, it's difficult to do that while also talking about gluttony. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we might realize that gluttony is a prevalent sin, that a lot of us struggle with it, but is it really that big a deal? Like compared to the other sins on the list, is it really that dangerous? Is it really that harmful? Well, let's look at scripture. Let's see, does scripture have anything to say about gluttony? It turns out, yes. It does. It has a lot to say about gluttony. And the verses in the Old Testament are particularly harsh towards it. I, I just want to give you some highlights real quick. In Deuteronomy 21, 20 through 21, the Israelites are advised to stone gluttons and, drug and drunkards. Stone them. Yikes. In Proverbs 23, 2, it says, put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Double yikes, right? In Proverbs 28, 7, it says, A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. So if you even hang out with gluttons, you are an embarrassment to the family name. Side note, do you ever read scripture and then thank God that you were born in this era and not in ancient Israel? That sounds rough. And the final verse from the Old Testament I want to read is Ezekiel 16:49 says, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. And those two clauses go together. They were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. Therefore, they did not help the poor and the needy. And I think this passage gets to the heart of why all the verses in the Old Testament are so harsh towards gluttony. See, in Old Testament times, food was not nearly as abundant as it is today in our culture, in American culture. And so people didn't just eat whatever they wanted, whenever, whenever they wanted, right? They never ate because they were bored uh, or because they had a craving, right? Like today, you can be like, I want a bacon cheeseburger with like uh, curly fries on top of it, and I want drowning in sriracha sauce, and I want tacos for my sides, and I want a, a large chocolate milkshake, and someone at Jack in the Box with a that's $5, right? And that's a real meal. I had it. It was okay. <laughs> it, it was okay. I mean, it was fine. It wasn't great. No, I wouldn't suggest it. But they, they couldn't do that back then, right? No, they, they prayed for their food. And when I say that, I don't mean like 
prayed before a meal, like, thank you, God, for this food. But no, they would like pray, like, God, please, can we have some food? Like, can you grow these crops? We're really hungry. Um, they would, worked incredibly hard for their food, and they all knew full well that food was a gift from God. So gluttony was seen as stealing God's gifts from others. So when you eat more than your fill, that means someone has less than enough to eat. And so if you were a gluttonous person, you were causing someone to go without, which was effectively starving them. So those earlier verses, while they might seem harsh still, they're not so harsh when you put them in context. Now, what about the New Testament? What does the New Testament have to say about gluttony? Well, let's look in our main passage for the day. We're going to be in Philippians 3. We're going to read verses 17 through 21. And it'll also be up on the screen. Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Here we go. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even through tears. They walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even to subject all things to himself. I love reading passages like this in particular because it reminds us that Paul was writing a very personal letter to people that he knew, to people that he Loved, And at the beginning of this letter, it, it starts, or at the beginning of this passage in particular, it starts with a plea. He says, please pay attention to me. Keep your eyes on me. Do what I do. Walk like I walk. Learn from me. And if you can't focus on me, then find someone else who walks uh, like Christ and pay attention to them. Do what they do. Learn from them. Strive to walk like they walk. Why is he making this plea? Well, let's look at verse 18 again. And let's see. Verse 18 says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So Paul says, I'm writing this to you through tears. Paul is sobbing as he writes about people that he knew, that he loved, that he shared the gospel with, who then made the decision to reject the free gift of grace that Jesus offers all of us. And it broke Paul's heart because he knew that their end is now destruction. And he's crying. And why would these people reject the gospel? Why would they do that? Let's look at verse 19. Verse 19, Paul says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And, their glory is, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ because their God is their bellies. And I, ultimately, I believe that that is really the best definition of gluttony that we can have. When our God is our bellies, when we are controlled by our appetites and by our cravings, whether it's food or it's alcohol or it's drugs or it's sex or it's control or it's power, whatever it is, gluttony is a deadly sin because when our God is our belly, that is idolatry. We cannot submit, we cannot surrender ourselves to Jesus if we are constantly controlled by our appetites. We can't worship God if we're too busy worshiping all of God's gifts and if we are consumed by our cravings. It's not possible. So here's a good uh, but difficult question to ask yourselves. Do I search for satisfaction in God or in God's gifts? Or to use Paul's language, is my mind set on earthly things? My daughters, Juliet and Scarlett, they have three sets of grandparents, which means that they are spoiled beyond belief. They have more clothes and they have more toys than they could ever possibly play with, but they try their best. And uh, Juliet in particular, she loves playing with all of her toys. But do you know what she loves more? When her mama or her dad plays toys with her. 
right? Or she loves it when we read books with her or we watch movies with her. And if she's upset or if she needs comfort, she's not going to go to her toys or her books or her movies. She's going to come to her parents. That is where she finds true comfort. Recently, Juliet and I were watching Frozen 2 again for the 15th time. And uh, I got a text message from a group of my friends, friends that I've had since high school. And they're like, hey, we're all on Xbox at the same time. It's a miracle. Hop on Xbox. Come on, we got to play. And again, so these have been my friends since high school, and we're all in our 30s now, and we all have like families and full-time jobs, so it's really difficult for us to all be online at the same time. So I look over at Juliet, and she's across the room. She's like on the other side of the room, and she is so super zoomed in, like zoned in to this movie. And so I decide to quietly try to slip away. And I go into the room right next door to try to play Xbox with my friends. And two minutes later, I hear this stomping. She, <laughs> Julia enters the room. She goes, dad, dad, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, I just, I'm, play- I don't know why I got nervous when she asked me. I was like, I'm just... <laughs> playing Xbox, just for a little bit, just for a couple minutes, play Xbox. And she goes, no, dad, dad, watch New Frozen with me. Now, that foot stomp is a recent development that she definitely got from her mom, uh, <laughs> not from me. And I could hear my friends like through my headset, like, ooh, <laughs> are you going to let your daughter talk to you that way? And I'm like, nah, nah, but uh, something did just come up and I got to go. <laughs> but really what it was is that, like, as much as I wanted to play Xbox with my buddies, it makes my heart so happy to know that Juliet wanted me in the room with her to watch the movie, because that's what makes her happy. That's where she finds true joy. The movies and the books and, and the toys, those are all just gifts that I bought her to enjoy. But the real joy, it comes from enjoying those gifts with her parents, That is what actually satisfies. Now, imagine if I had bought her all those things, right? All these toys and books and movies, and then I just left her alone with all of her gifts. Like I build her a big playpen, and I fill fill it with, you know, all these toys and and books. I sprinkle some goldfish in there, put a bowl of water, put on Frozen 2, and then I just leave. Where is she going to find her satisfaction? Where is she going to find her joy? She's going to try to find satisfaction and joy from all of those gifts, from all those things. And she'll find some. She'll find some satisfaction for a little bit, but it will always be fleeting. What was new and fun and satisfying yesterday is now old and boring today, and she will consume and consume, and she'll build up this craving that is insatiable until she realized she'll never find the satisfaction that she is just desperate for. And that is what happens when we try to find enjoyment in God's gifts apart from God. We all have desires, all of us. We all have desires that can only truly be satisfied in the infinite. But we all, we just search for that satisfaction in the finite, and we're never going to find it. It might might satisfy us for a little bit, right? But it will never fully ever satisfy us. So we dive deeper deeper and deeper in our search for gratification, which leads us deeper and deeper into bondage until the God that we worship and surrender to is our own bellies. And we will get to the point where we will indulge until it makes us sick, and yet at the same time, we somehow feel hollow inside. There's this amazing quote from Frederick Buechner. He says, a glutton is one who raids the icebox in search of a cure for spiritual malnutrition. So is gluttony dangerous? Yes, absolutely. It's idolatry. It's the never-ending search for that next high, and it will leave you spiritually malnourished. But the good news is, that the one true source of everlasting satisfaction, he is available for you today, right now, with open arms. 
This is a truth that the King David learned when he was in his darkest, most desperate, leanest moments when he had been searching for satisfaction and gratification from all kinds of other sources and it always left him empty. He finally came to the truth in Psalms 145 verses 15 through 17 when he says, all eyes look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and he's gracious in all of his acts. It is God that opens his hand to satisfy the desire of every living thing. Throughout the Psalms, David would cry out, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. In Psalm 34, 8, David cried out, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the man who takes refuge in him. We are all, all of us, searching for meaning and satisfaction. We all want joy and comfort in the God of all creation, the giver of every good gift. He wants that for you too and more. He wants you to taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the man who finds refuge in him? Don't watch Frozen 2 without God. He wants you to watch the movie with him. But I think far too often we settle for the fleeting satisfaction that is easy and immediate. In fact, tons and tons of scientific studies have been done on how humans across the board view smaller and immediate rewards as more valuable than larger, more distant rewards. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. In other words, what potentially maybe awaits us in the future has very little impact on our decision-making in the present. We want the sure thing because who knows what tomorrow will bring, right? Just go ask any little kid. Go say, hey, do you want $5 right now or do you want $10 in a week? I guarantee you that most of them will say, well, I'll take the $5 now, please. Like, would you rather eat whatever you want, whenever you want now, and maybe potentially shorten your lifespan? Or would you rather control your cravings and eat healthier and maybe lengthen your lifespan? Well, it's like, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow, so bring on the bluebell. (laughs) This is why Paul's reminder in verses 20 and 21 of the promise that we have in Jesus is so important for us to always remember. Let's read it again. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It is crucial that we remind ourselves all the time, every day, that our citizenship is in heaven right now, more so than we're Houstonians, more so than we're Texans, more so than we are Americans. We are citizens of heaven right now. And the reminder, this reminder of our present reality that we are citizens of heaven points to a future reality, that one day every citizen of heaven will come face to face with their savior, Jesus Christ, who will transform their lowly bodies into a glorious body just like his. And that future reality is not just a possibility, it's a guarantee. I don't have to worry about if I'm going to get hit by a bus tomorrow because I know that I'm a citizen of heaven right now. And because of the work that Christ did on the cross when he suffered and died for the sins of all mankind and because he was resurrected three days later, defeating death, defeating Satan, I know that one day I will have a resurrection just like his. That's the future promise that awaits me. My savior will transform this lowly body into a glorious body just like his, eternal and free of pain, free of suffering. And I will spend all eternity in the presence of, in the source of all love and truth, the giver of all good gifts. That's the future that awaits me. And if that doesn't sound like good news to you, if that doesn't sound like the meaning and joy and comfort and satisfaction that you're looking for, I don't know what else to tell you. But if this gospel promise sounds exactly like what you're looking for. If you are tired of being controlled by your appetites, if you are tired of the endless, fruitless search for meaning and satisfaction, this gospel promise is for you today. 
right this moment. The question is, are you willing to surrender yourself to Jesus as Lord? Are you going to walk in a manner that is worthy of the cross of Christ? Or are you going to walk as an enemy of the cross of Christ by allowing your appetites to control you? Basically, is your God found in Scripture or is your God found in your own belly? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And so I want to recommend a spiritual practice for all of us that I think helps in controlling the sin of gluttony uh, and also helps to transform our appetites so that the Lord becomes our portion, so that the Lord is what we crave, where we seek satisfaction. And that spiritual practice is fasting. Now, I am well aware that uh, when many of us, when we hear the word fasting, our stomachs drop because fasting of all the spiritual practices is definitely one of the more intimidating spiritual practices. And we live in a culture that says, oh, are you missing something from life? Well, here, try this or add this or buy this, and then maybe, maybe your life will be better. And then fasting goes the opposite route. It says you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to add anything to your plate to find satisfaction. In fact, you need to do without for a little bit. You need to do without for a while to try to make some space for God to invade your life and fill your life with the satisfaction that can only be found in him. That is why we fast. Also, I figured if I'm going to ask you guys to fast, that I should probably practice what I preach. Uh, I have fasted before, um, but I'm not sure if it was ever for the right reasons. I always fasted because like, oh, I'm I'm supposed to. Also, my fasts uh, in the past, they they never really pushed me too far out of my comfort zone. So I decided that I was going to have a traditional fast. No food, only water. And trying to decide how long I was going to do it, I thought, well, I think 40 hours sounds like a good amount of time. Jesus fasted for 40 days, but I don't want to die. So I'm going to try 40 hours. That should be enough to really stretch me out of my comfort zone. Well, confession time. Uh, It turns out that 24 hours was plenty of time to stretch me out of my comfort zone. I tried. I really did. I, I tried to make it 40 hours. You know, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was very, very weak. And uh, I, ha- I will say it was still just a great time of growth and of learning to depend more on God and focus my attention on him. Also, I'll give myself a little bit of grace in that uh, I take two daily medications that I have to take every day, and both of them you're supposed to take with food. Obviously, I couldn't do that while I was fasting, so my stomach was on fire for a good portion of the day. I hurt. And I say that to say that maybe some of you are in a similar situation. Right? Maybe uh, because of medicine you take or because of a medical condition, something like that, you, you can't fast from food. It just wouldn't be good for you. That's okay. The fast doesn't necessarily have to be from food. It can be from something else, something that you crave on a regular basis. Right? It can be social media. It can be video games. It can be sweets. It can be alcohol. It can be television. Whatever it is, just make sure it's something that does push you outside of your comfort zone to turn your attention towards God. And so I want to share a couple of just quick pastoral tips for you for when you hopefully make the decision to try fasting. The first one is to have a clear, specific goal in mind of what it is that you hope to attain during your fast. So like, obviously, the big goal is to find our satisfaction in God, right? We want to, again, transform our appetites so that the Lord becomes our portion, Um, But this practice really does work best when you're really specific about what that looks like for you. So for instance, maybe your goal is to experience more of God's presence because your schedule is so just hectic every single day. It's wall to wall with meetings and kids and and, football practice and whatever else it is, right? And so you often feel like God is just absent from your life. So you fast to try to make space for God to come in and interrupt your daily grind, your daily schedule. Or maybe you fast to try to make yourself more mindful of the needs of others around you. You've been convicted lately that you are just way too inwardly focused, that you often just only think about yourself. So you fast and you pray for God to expand your ability to love and to care for others the way that he calls us to. My goal when I fasted was to experience more of the hope that is found in God. Um, We live in a world where Hope can be scarce, it can be difficult to come by, and I have what is called a winter soul. Uh, so what that means is that I'm naturally more inclined towards like cynicism and doubt. Um, 
And so I want my life, though, to uh, be marked by the hope that is found in Jesus. So that was my goal. So when I fasted, I would focus on the promises of God um, to try to uh, allow God's hope to just fill my life. And then the final tip is uh, you need to ask yourself, what am I going to add during my fast? What will I add during my fast? So fasting is not just about giving something up. It's the perfect opportunity to add spiritual practices that you've never ever tried before, that are brand new to you. And these spiritual practices, they don't have to be outlandish, right? Uh, The goal, though, is to open up new spiritual avenues for God to speak to you. So, again, if, if you're the person whose day is constantly hectic, you're constantly going, 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 maybe try incorporating just 15 minutes of, of silence or meditation. 15 minutes, that's it, right? That's not too bad. Or um, maybe you have trouble really getting into Scripture. Like you try, but it's like, ugh, you just struggle reading Scripture. Well, maybe while you're fasting, every time you get in the car, instead of listening to music or podcasts or whatever, you listen to the Bible on CD or tape or iPod, wherever it is now. Uh, It's so cool. Like you can have Morgan Freeman read you the Bible. That's amazing, right? Um, Or maybe you memorize one verse every day. That's your goal. I'm going to memorize one verse every day until by the end of my fast, I have an entire chapter of scripture memorized. That's an awesome goal. I highly recommend 1 John 4 if you're looking for a place to start doing that. It can even be as simple as just getting outside for 30 minutes a day while you're praying. That's it. I know a a lot of you spend a majority of your day staring at a computer screen indoors. So there's something about just getting outside and being in nature that can really be food for the soul. Right? For me, it was journaling. I had never journaled. Uh, I was journaling and adding additional prayer times to my day when I would normally be eating, and I found that to be very beneficial as well. Uh, also, there is a perfect opportunity for us to begin practicing fasting, uh, which is coming up this Wednesday. So this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It is the beginning of the Lent season where we fast for 40 days in anticipation of Good Friday and of Resurrection Sunday. And I highly recommend you come to one of those services. We've added a third service so to make it more available for everyone. So there's a service at 7 at noon and then at 7 at, uh, in the evening. And I have heard Kyle's message. Kyle's preaching that day, uh, the young adult slash prayer pastor, and I've heard it, and it's fantastic. Uh, it's one you don't want to miss. And so I highly recommend coming to that service And between now and then, I want us all to be in prayer. I want us all to be asking God, what is it that I need to fast from so that I can become more dependent on you? So that you can become the source of meaning and satisfaction in my life. And then ask God, what is my goal for fasting? Like, God, show me the areas of my life where I am spiritually malnourished, where I might not even realize it. What is my goal for fasting? And ask the Holy Spirit to call to your mind specific ways that God can invade your life to begin to fill you up with more of him. In fact, I want us to start that prayer now. Right now is the perfect time to start because we're all together. And how rare is it that we're all together and we can actually take some time to just be silent together, to just be still, and to open up our hearts and our minds to the Spirit. And and hopefully God will speak to us in these moments. So I want us all to really take this moment um, as an opportunity. This is a sacred moment, right? This is an opportunity for God to speak to you, for the Spirit to work in your heart. So I want us all to bow our heads, and we're going to pray together. I'm going to kind of guide us along in prayer, and there's going to be moments of silence where you just need to allow the Spirit to speak to you and hopefully reveal to you areas where you can fast. Let's pray now. Father, I'm so thankful for all of my brothers and sisters in this room I'm so thankful that you are a God who loves us beyond what we can ever imagine, and you want what's best for us. You want a life full of meaning and satisfaction and joy. It's so easy to get tangled up in uh, all the traps of this world. It's so easy to have our minds focused on the things of this world. And so, Father, right now, I want to ask your Spirit to come and just invade this place, invade our hearts. Father, and first I want to ask, Father, that you reveal to us what is it that you need us to fast from so that we become more dependent on you. Reveal to us in our hearts the things that we typically crave so we can fast from those things and instead crave you. So why don't you take a moment and pray for those things now.
Father, we all long to be just filled with your love and your truth, to find our comfort in you. And so, Father, right now, I pray that your spirit is working on our hearts as we ask you, what is my specific goal for this fast? Reveal to us, God, what is it? What parts of our lives are we not dependent on you? Where are we spiritually malnourished? Take some time and ask God now. Finally, God, I ask that you just reveal to us things that we can add to our lives as we're fasting, different spiritual practices that you reveal to us, um, things that we can add that will draw us closer to you, that will make us more dependent on you, that will shake up our spiritual lives and allow you to invade our worlds. And so, Father, we ask that you reveal to us right now, what is it that I can add to my life as I fast? Father, you are the source of all love and truth. Father, you are the, are the giver of every good gift. Father, you love us more than we could possibly comprehend. I pray that we trust in that truth right now, that we trust that you want what's best for us, that you're not trying to withhold anything from us, that you're not trying to prevent fun from us, but that you want us to, to live according to your ways because that is where true life is found. That's where a life that flourishes is found. It's found only in you. You are the only one that can fully satisfy our desires. You are the only one that can truly give our lives meaning and joy and comfort. And so I pray that all of us leave this room today desiring only you, searching for comfort in only you, finding our satisfaction in only you. Father, we're just so thankful for the countless blessings that you give us, blessings that we often don't even realize or we don't acknowledge. And we're thankful for your love. And we love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.